So the next lecture in this unit is time dilation. This is section 11.2 from your textbook. And we talked a bit about the, um, some of the strange things that happen when we start to uh, uh, work with the special theory of relativity. And the first one we'll look at is um, how does time get affected when we're traveling at speeds close to the speed of light? So going back to those two postulates of the special theory of relativity, um, while they seem pretty straightforward uh, and they don't really seem that spectacular, um, what, what is interesting is when we consider uh, what happens as we move closer and closer to the speed of light. So Einstein performed what we call thought experiments. And uh, I'd like you to copy down the note uh, so that you have a definition of what a thought experiment is. It's an experiment carried out in the imagination, but not actually performed. And what Einstein did was that uh, um, he, he basically posited these, uh, these theories, and um, he, he imagined if we were traveling at close to the speed of light, um, what would happen, considering that we have a speed of light limit, uh, what would happen to our understanding of time? So here's the thought experiment that, that Albert Einstein um, postulated. So it says, Einstein analyzed the operation of a simple clock in a thought experiment. So this clock keeps time in a frame that, for the purpose of the thought experiment, is at rest. So this is how his clock measures time. Um, it measures the time using a pulse of light that's traveling back and forth between two mirrors. So if we shoot um, a, a beam of light from one mirror to another, um, the, the distance between the mirrors we'll call D, and the, uh, the time it takes for those mirrors to travel would be uh, that D twice, so 2D, divided by the speed that the light travels, which is C. So 2D over C. So this is our, our, our clock that's measuring time based on um, the speed of light and light making this round trip between two different mirrors. So imagine if we had this clock and it's moving at a constant horizontal speed of V. So observer one, let's say he's on a train car and he's looking at this clock. Um, in his frame of reference, um, the, the time traveled, uh, or rather the time, would be 2D over C, uh, which is the same time that you would have if the clock was stationary. So this is what we call the proper time. So the, the clock observed in the, in a, um, uh, by somebody who's in the its same frame of reference can always be considered at rest. Now we're talking about this as a clock, but this could be any process. So for any process um, that's moving at a constant velocity or that is uh, stationary, um, it, uh, if it's being observed in that same frame of reference, it's called the proper time. So I'd like you to copy the definition down for proper time which is the time as measured by an observer who is stationary relative to the clock or process. So the time interval for a particular clock or process as measured by an observer who is stationary relative to that clock is called the proper time. Now the word proper doesn't mean that the measurements of time in other frames are incorrect. Um, it simply means that uh, we're, we're considering um, that time to be uh, the time measured by, by that observer who's also moving relative to the clock. So that's just uh, proper is the name that's given to it, but it doesn't mean that that's the correct time and the other times are incorrect. So now let's look, uh, just like we did in, in our previous lecture, um, let's have an observer too. Um, this observer is watching the, uh, um, the clock uh, from a frame of reference that is um, uh, I guess that is stationary to the frame of reference of the person and the clock that's moving. So um, for this observer, what they would see is a parabolic motion um, of, the, 
uh, or rather not a parabolic motion, but they would see the um, the, the light moving up, uh, hitting the one mirror um, at a midpoint, and then moving down and hitting the other mirror um, at another point. And it would actually create a, a triangle. It would be an isosceles triangle. Um, and uh, that person would measure time uh, a little bit differently because um, in this case, the time uh, or the uh, uh, time which is measured as um, uh, 2d over sorry uh, 2d over C is it's the same except our D is a little bit different um, so we'll, we'll look at how we can calculate that by analyzing the triangle on the next slide but observer 2 will have a different measurement of time and the observer 2's measurement of time, because the distance traveled is longer, will have to be greater than the proper time. So we call this relativistic time. And this is the uh, time interval for a particular clock or process as measured by an observer who is moving relative to that clock. And that while that observer 2 in the previous example is stationary, um, because that frame of reference of the proper time is moving, we can consider that the stationary observer is moving relative to the clock. So please copy down the definition for relativistic time. So now we get into time dilation. And I've already kind of uh, mentioned this a little bit. Um, and you can sort of see the, the triangle that's formed, the isosceles triangle that's formed. Um, and uh, it's analyzed on the uh, right of your screen. Um, so it says, using geometry and the fact that light travels at C, for observer 2, the light pulse covers a total vertical distance of 2D, but the horizontal distance is V delta TM. So in addition, the path of the light pulses forms the hypotenuse Z of the two back-to-back -back right triangles. So according to observer 2, the round trip travel distance for the light pulse is 2z, not 2d. And 2z is going to be longer than 2d. And z would be equal to, if we analyze that triangle, it's the square root of d squared plus v delta tm over 2 squared. Or it's the square root of uh, d squared plus v times the relativistic time over 2 squared. So that gets us into, um, if we substitute this into an equation here, uh, we can see that the relativistic time is equal to the proper time divided by this relativistic factor of the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. So this equation indicates that um, delta Tm and delta Ts are different or relativistic for each observer. So the proper time and the relativistic time are different for the, for the observers. Uh, so in other words, the time interval required for the pulses of light to travel between the two mirrors depends on the relative motion between the observers. So what Einstein basically determined in this thought experiment is that time is not absolute. Time is dependent on the motion of uh, the observer and the motion of the, um, of the clock or the process. So it says uh, if we divide both sides by the proper time then we can find the ratio of uh, the relativistic time as measured by observer 2 uh, to delta Ts. And uh, that should there should be a 1 in the numerator here. So it should be delta Tm over delta Ts equals 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. And the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared is called the relativistic factor. Uh, the note here says, this equation describes the phenomena of time dilation. In other words, according to observer 2, a moving clock will take longer for each tick. And since v is less than c, then the relativistic time over the proper time is greater than or equal to 1. Or we can say the relativistic time is greater than or equal to the proper time. So 
therefore, special relativity predicts that moving clocks run more slowly from the point of view of an observer at rest. So one thing you can use as a, as a tip, um, and I'd like you to copy down, uh, relativistic time is greater than or equal to proper time. And this is a, this, you can use this as a, um, a way to help you solve some problems because if you're solving a problem and you have that the other way around where your proper time is greater than your relativistic time, you, you've considered something incorrectly. It takes some time to get, to, uh, uh, to get used to it. So we will uh, we'll practice it a bit. Um, and hopefully you'll, um, you'll be able to understand which, which, when reading a question, what is the relativistic time and what is the proper time. I'd like you to copy this slide down as well. It says uh, time dilation, which is the slowing down of time in one frame of reference that is moving relative to an observer in another frame of reference. Um, and you can copy down the equation and all of the other information there. Um, I'll mention again, WRT is a short form for with respect to. So here's a, a, a question here. It says, um, if the equation for time dilation is true and the experiments have conclusively shown that it is, why have we not noticed time dilation before now? So uh, this is th these relativistic equations are true for all interactions, whether they are interactions close to the speed of light or not close to the speed of light. If we graph this, um, what you'll notice is when our v is very small, uh, the relativistic factor is close to 1. We won't notice any sort of change. As soon as our v starts to get larger um, and closer to c, we start to notice an effect. And we don't actually start to notice that effect until we're at about 0.1c, so 10% of the speed of light. So even though these, are, these equations are true, we don't rel notice relativistic time in our daily life because we don't, we don't work with things that are moving um, at 10% of the speed of light. The next question here um, is going to involve using the time dilation equation. So it says, Roger is traveling with a speed of 0.85c relative to Mia. Roger travels for 30 seconds as measured on his watch. So we have to uh, determine who measures proper time for Roger's trip, Roger or Mia. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm just going to cut my screen here a bit so that we can uh, do these both at the same time. The first question um, is that the proper time is measured by the person who's, m who's moving relative to the clock. And Roger is looking at his clock, his watch. He has 30 seconds on his watch. That means Roger is the one who measures the proper time in this question. If we move to the second part of this question, it says what, um, calculate the elapsed time on Mia's watch during this motion. And I just noticed a mistake here. It says uh, delta TS as proper time. That's not true, it should be delta TM because our delta TS is 30 seconds. The equation we use is uh, the um, time dilation equation. So that's delta TM equals delta TS over the relativistic factor, 1 minus V squared over C squared. Now, uh, when we're using this equation, um, uh, sorry, I guess we have on the one other given. V is equal to 0.85C. When we're using this equation, quite often we just substitute, um, uh, we don't actually multiply this by C. We substitute it as 0.85C, and our C squareds will get divided out. So I'll show you how this works. When I use this equation here, delta Tm equals our proper time, which is 30 seconds, over the 1 minus 0 0.85 c squared over c squared. This c squared and this c squared will divide out. So this becomes 30 over 1 minus 0 0.85 squared. And um, my 30 was actually technically 30.0. So I have three, three um, 
significant digits here. So I'm going to put 30 divided by uh, 1 minus 0.85 squared, close the bracket, and hit equals. Oops, sorry, something went wrong there. Uh, 30 divided by um, bracket 1 minus 0.85 squared, uh, close the bracket, square root, and I get 50 point, or sorry, 59, sorry, 56.9 seconds. That's my relativistic time for this question. Here's another question. It says, um, a rocket ship speeds past an asteroid, and it speeds past at 0.85c. So my v, in this case, is 0. Sorry, 800C. So I have three significant digits. The observer uh, in the rocket sees 10 seconds pass. So is this relativistic time or is this proper time? I'll let you think about it a bit. It's proper time because the observer is the one uh, who is moving with the clock. So my relativistic equation will be 10 divided by the square root of 1 minus 0 0.8 c squared over c squared. So this is 10 over the square root of 1 minus 0 0.8 squared. And that works out to um, 10 oops, 10 minus um, bracket, 1 minus 0.8 times 0.8, close the bracket, square root, 9 point, oops, that's wrong. 10 divided by um, bracket, 1 minus 0.8 times 0.8, close the bracket, square root of that, oops, that's still going to be wrong. No, there it is. I had it wrong the, the first time, but um, this time it worked out correct. So it's 16.7 seconds is my relativistic time. Okay, let's look at another question here. Um, so this talks about a tau particle. And uh, a tau particle, we'll look at these uh, in the second part of this unit. But a tau particle, basically, you can consider it to be um, uh, it's something that is uh, that moves close to relativistic speeds. So um, its lifetime is 1.5 times 10 to the thir negative 13. So regardless of how fast it's moving, it will last in its frame of reference 1.5 times 10 to the negative 13 seconds before it dissipates. And it's in this experiment, it's accelerated to 95% of C. Um, what will be its lifetime according to the laboratory's frame of reference? So the laboratory is not moving, um, but the tau particle is. So the tau particle's proper time is its lifetime here. That's only two significant digits. Um, it's moving at this speed, so the relativistic time is going to appear to be longer. Um, so it's going to be 1.5 times 10 to the negative 13 over the square root of, and sometimes you could even just simplify this without doing the c squared part, 95 squared. 1 minus 0.95 squared. So uh, that works out to um, 1.5 times 10 to the power of 13 negative divided by my bracket here 1 minus 0.95 squared and then I have to find the square root of that I get 4.8 times 10 to the negative 13 seconds so that's my time of the tau particle in the laboratory's frame of reference so it appears that this tau particle existed for longer than its lifetime. But in the 
tau particle's frame of reference, regardless of how fast it's moving, it in its frame of reference, it experiences 1.5 times 10 to the negative 13 seconds before it dissipates. So that's the curious part about this. Um, the tau particle would have not experienced any sort of time dilation in its frame of reference. But in the laboratory's frame of reference, the tau particle exists longer than it would normally. So um, this is pretty strange, this time dilation stuff. And it actually, uh, uh, some scientists were um, unwilling to accept this. Um, but uh, uh, by the mid 20th century, we were able to, uh, to experiment with this a bit more. And um, uh, with the uh, invention of um, uh, jets that were able to travel um, quite fast, um, what was done uh, was an experiment using atomic clocks uh, on passenger jets. And uh, what they did was they had these jet aircraft fly around the world twice. Uh, and they measured these atomic clocks. They also compared them to clocks that were on the Earth's surface. So an atomic clock is a very, very accurate clock. Uh, so what they found was that the clocks on the Earth's surface were uh, uh, 273 nanoseconds slower than the westbound clock and 332 nanoseconds slower than the eastbound clock. The expected error was about 25 nanoseconds. They repeated this experiment uh, and improved the accuracy, and they, all of them found that there was a, a sl very slight time dilation. Um, now, what's interesting about this is um, uh, in your frame of reference, the person, if you're the, on the, in the clock's frame of reference, they didn't exist any longer. Uh, so um, the uh, uh, the process that they were engaged in uh, of measuring uh, time, um, uh, and these are atomic clocks, so they measure time by um, by movement of subatomic particles. Um, their subatomic particles moved uh, um, as expected, even though they were traveling um, at fast speeds. And when they were being observed, um, if they could have been observed very closely, uh, it would have no been noted that they were um, they were traveling over longer distances than they would have actually been traveling. So it's it's very very curious kind of situation that when we're talking about relativistic time. But what we need to understand is that both frame of ref frames of reference are correct. So the clock that's traveling has a frame of reference uh, where time was experienced slower than time on Earth but both of those frames of reference are correct. Um, another uh, kind of experiment that we notice is um, with our global positioning satellites. Um, so GPS satellites, uh, there's uh, about 30 or so of them uh, around the Earth. And uh, because, um, because of the fact that they're moving uh, uh, a bit faster than the Earth, um, they have to be corrected uh, for their their accuracy of their time. Um, so, in terms of uh, um, time dilation, if they were not corrected, um, they would lose up to 11 kilometers of accuracy uh, per day um, if we did not consider relativistic effects. So when it comes to, um, is, this a pra is there practical applications of this? There are, when we're dealing with things like um, satellites circling the Earth. Uh, and we, if we want those to be accurate, we have to keep that in mind. Uh, any, any sort of space travel would, in, would involve this because we're traveling at faster speeds as well. And any sort of observation in a laboratory of um, smaller particles that travel close to relativistic speeds would have this effect as well. So here's uh, another thing that you can copy down for time dilation. Um, numerous experiments have provided evidence. The atomic clock aircraft, jet aircraft experiment and uh, time dilation is noted um, with the accuracy of GPS systems as well.
All right, last uh, question we're going to go through before this lecture is done. It says two identical clocks are synchronized. One clock stays on Earth. The other clock orbits Earth for one year as measured by the clock on Earth. Uh, after the year elapses, the orbiting clock returns to Earth for comparison with the stationary clock. Would these clocks remain synchronized? This is essentially a repetition of the um, atomic clock passenger jet experiment. So we know that, no, the two clocks would not be synchronized. Um, the uh, clock on Earth um, uh, would, um, sorry, the clock on Earth would be, uh, uh, would have experienced more time than the traveling clock. So the clock on Earth uh, will have um, uh, some sort of relativistic effect that was applied to it in terms of the time that it measures. Next part of this question, it says, which clock has the right time? And this is the very confusing part for a lot of students. But both times on the clocks are correct. Time is relative. So the proper time is not the correct time any more than the relativistic time. This is something that's a bit harder to wrap your head around, but uh, we have to understand that um, the time we experience on Earth, um, you can consider it as one second per second time. But uh, as soon as we start traveling at relativistic speeds, um, it's one second is um, something less than a second in terms of, of how we observe it. So. Uh, both times are correct. 